Okay, thanks everyone. Um, and now we'll just do some questions, so hopefully you remembered your questions. I think there's one microphone that you can go to if you do have any questions. Or if you disagree with everything. We can just Hello. Hi, go ahead. Thanks for reminding me to write on a question because I'm actually very nervous. So as we're talking about substance, and thanks everyone for um, sharing your knowledge. Um, when we're talking about substance use, the topic of trauma comes to my mind. So in terms of trauma or relational injuries, especially a lot of us who are in the queer community, either it's systematic injuries or bigger, um, where does that come into in terms of treatment or barriers? Um, I mean, competencies of uh, caregivers, too, in your research. Thank you. So I'm happy, I'm happy to start answering that question. Um, the huge issue with our, the current state of our health care service delivery system is it's not set up to deal with very effectively mental health or substance use, let alone the two when there's co-occurring issues. And we know substance use very frequently, it's highly associated with mental health um, disorder for the, for, for lack of a better term. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, of really good work that is being done um, for those who are experiencing trauma, for example, or who have experienced trauma, and there are some services available. I'm most aware of the ones here in Vancouver. Um, but a lot of those are severely underfunded, under-resourced, and um, uh, and I don't want to end sort of my comment on a really negative note. The, the sort of the positive side of things is sometimes what we're seeing within the research we're conducting with young uh, gay and queer men who use substances, uh, many of them have described experiences of previous trauma, um, is that the resources that they're telling us that are most effective for them are the resources that are being delivered at the level of the community. So it's those community-based organizations that are often providing them with what, not just help to survive day to day, but to actually respond to some of their needs associated with trauma, so. Good question. Uh, I had a question for PJ specifically um, regarding access to <coughs> okay um, regarding um, access to um, drug che checking services. Um, how can we improve access to drug checking services for street entrenched populations or for people who are active in addiction? Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. Like, um, so the access of drug checking services is a huge question, huge question, and I think it depends on the different population who access this service. Um, in terms of access of, of drug checking services, like um, the prevention like, the, and the promotion like online, which is like uh, using like the different networks or the different platform like Facebook um, are really like uh, facilitate the access um, for, for young who are street engaged. Um, and I think also like there is also like the, the particular networks like close to this site who can have an impact of the access of um, this kind of population. Thank you. Uh, my best friend has struggled with alcohol use all his life, uh, self-medicating as a result of childhood sexual abuse. And through my friendship with him, uh, I've come to realize that uh, one part of the conversation where I think we're failing as a province, and I can't speak for other provinces, is the whole rehabilitation.
program offering, regardless of whether it's tailored to the communities we're talking about in this room. Uh, my friend's at Burnaby now, and he's been at Burnaby four times in the seven years I've known him. If it didn't work the first time, why'd they send him the second time? If they didn't work the second time, why'd they send him the third time, and now the fourth time? Um, my sense of rehab services here in the community and in the province of British Columbia is if they were baseball players, they would be batting so low, they would be sent down to the minors. And so we let this go on and on and on with people who are fortunate enough to get births in rehab programs, not exactly getting to steady ground. And how do we get the mental health substance use community to deal with programs that actually have happy outcomes as the programs as opposed to programs that have no outcomes. I, I mean I I totally agree that a lot of these programs are are ineffective and not evidence based. Um, so, I mean, all I can say is, yeah, I agree. I don't have the answer. This is sort of what everyone is thinking about all the time um, with respect, especially with those folks who are, um, who are recovering for short periods of time and then um, beginning to use again. And um, it comes back to we, we, don't have a, a, we don't have a system of substance use care. We don't have a system for mental health care. And so... It's not even about adapting the current system. We need to build a system in the first place. So um, there's a lot of work to be done, but I, I totally hear you. I've also, you know, we've seen a lot of participants in our, in our empirical work. I have friends who've gone in and out of these kinds of programs, so. Can I, just, I just want to say something about the alcohol, because I'm so glad that you brought this topic, because in our interviews, I did not mention it, but, you know, substance use, uh, people that work in substance use care, they say like most of most of their LGBT, like the substance that's more prevalent among LGBTQ people is not like crystal meth, like we want to think. It's actually alcohol, and actually I think it's kind of interesting. I've been to all the summits, the 15 of them. That's my little pride here, but I would say that I have never seen a single person doing a presentation on alcohol. So there's nobody doing research. There's nobody. Uh, on this topic, and it's a huge gap considering that it's probably the most prevalent addiction in our community. Nobody wants to talk about it because it's not very sexy, and nobody wants to fund this research because our government are profiting from the sale of alcohol, and we really need to get behind uh, this topic as a community. That's my little rant. Um, and then uh, we probably just I guess we've got two more questions, so if we could do them real quick. And I'll just do a plug that says that recovery does work. I'm in recovery from alcohol and drugs. So if you're looking for anyone who you need support, it does exist. So I'm not disagreeing with anything that anyone's saying about ineffective services, but I just want to put a plug out there that I'm, it is still a problem, but recovery is possible. So next question. Thank you. Hi, so I support a youth detox program in Kelowna, British Columbia, and in BC, the mental health services for youth are run by the Ministry of Children and Family Development, and the substance use services are run by the Ministry of Health. So sort of two-part question, is there some good research into the LGBTQ substance use accessibility for um, those involved in the MCFD system? And then is there evidence or a move or a political will to unite those two systems? Because it's just so absolutely stupid that they exist in their own little world. <laughs> That's a yes. good... <laughs> Love the question, don't have the answers. <laughs> With the. Oh. oh yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't have an answer to your. Yeah. I don't have an answer to your question. Um, it is. It is. Yeah. I, I just want to mention um, one uh, promising initiative that's provincial in scope, and I can't remember if they have a Kelowna location, but the, the foundry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what and, and is your what is your impression about how it's doing around the integration of those silos?
the found oh there it goes. Uh, the foundry has been really good for us. Uh, lots of good for mild to moderate intervention. Uh, where we're finding it very difficult is in the more severe, more like heavily concurrent personality disorder, homelessness, that sort of stuff going on with them. It's it, it, it's great that people show up there, but now they're how do we get them to the resource that is actually meaningful to them? And so that's been our experience. It's certainly helpful. I just don't think, I think when Foundry come on, everybody's like, all right, done. Like, thanks guys. But like, that's not what has been our experience. Yeah, thanks. Mm. Just a quick question for Travis. Uh, the mind map, amazing, BC. Are there other models in other provinces that you've looked at? Other, other ways to check across Canada for that kind of resource? Yeah, um, we're, we're definitely not the first people to think of this. Um, is, is Roberto here from Max Ottawa? So Roberto from Max presented on a similar um, scan, environmental scan that they did to identify um, queer affirming mental health services in the Ottawa region. Uh, that was actually one of the inspirations for using MindMap. Um, and I think... Um, I, I'll just add um, one barrier that we've faced in trying to develop MindMap, which is that very few people want to take uh, the responsibility for vetting services for being queer trans affirming. That's been a big challenge, um, and you know I'm grateful that through the through the roundtable we have the opportunity to do some of that work. But when I went to BC211 and HealthLink and I said, actually, this is your job as the government, like you should be adding the, the, this functionality to the database. They said, we're very nervous about making assessments about whether providers are or are not queer trans affirming. So um, that's, I think, you know, when we think about how to scale this nationally, we need to think about like, what is the system that we use to determine whether a service does or doesn't work for queer trans people. Thanks everyone. And thanks for your questions and thanks to the panelists. <laughs>